you say a few words about this wonderful collection of poems and explore Dantica's poem with you. And then after that, we'll have a longer meditation and time to talk. So the Terragata are actually among the first poems spoken by women that we know about. Um, the very first poems, and they, they are, this collection of poems is actually the first anthology of women's literature ever recorded. And the Terragata comprises 73 poems attributed to about 101 nuns. So you might be wondering, well, how that, how's that possible? And it's possible because some of the poems were written by groups, not by individuals. And given the elapsed time of you know, 2,600 years or thereabouts, it's difficult to definitively attribute particular poems to a single specific nun. However, we do know that the nuns named in these poems, and each each poem has uh, is headed by a nun's name. We know that these nuns existed because they are mentioned elsewhere in the suttas. So it's not like they were just made up by groups and then given a um, you know a nominal name. These nuns actually existed. And the Terragata, there's a collection were was composed over a 300 year period from the time of the Buddha to about 200 BCE. And so many of the Terragata poems were written by nuns who actually knew the Buddha, were practicing with the Buddha. And the Terragata forms part of the Pali Canon and is a companion text to the Terra Gatas written by monks. And um, the Terra Gata is actually significantly longer than the Terra perhaps not surprisingly. There are more monks and often men, I think, have more to say. But anyway, um, let me also say that the the Terragata is probably not actually verbatim what the nuns actually said, because these poems were transmitted orally for about five to six hundred years before they were written down um, and written in, in Pali. Now they've been translated from Pali into English uh, probably roughly about ten times, and I'm going to be using two recent translations. One is by um, a woman called Susan Murcott in her book, and I don't know if you can see this, The First Buddhist Women, came out in 1991. And the second is by um, a man called Matty Weingast, and it came out in 2020. And it's a bit, I don't know if you can it's a bit glary, you probably can't see that. It's called The First Free Women. And this one, this most recent um, book, is not a literal translation of the poems. It's more of a translation and then an adaptation. And um, some scholars and practitioners have been quite critical of, of Matty Weingast's book because they say that he actually created new poems that altered the meaning of the originals. However, um, his versions have been endorsed by many bhikkhunis, um, many nuns who I deeply respect, um, including Ayananda Bodhi, um, Aya Santachita, um, Aya Santakusika and Aya Chittananda, who are familiar to the Bellingham group. So um, I feel good about using this version as well as the more literal translation. 
And these, these poems were spoken by nuns who were enlightened, who were fully awakened, nuns of all ages, all backgrounds, all temperaments, all different social status, all who came to the Buddhist path and to awakening in their own ways. These are poems written by princesses and prostitutes, the tired wives of arranged marriages, um, some written by those desperately in love, some born into poverty and some born into wealth. Some of these poems are about the nun's lives before awakening, um, some are about awakening itself and some are about after awakening or a combination. Several of them are about encounters with Mara, the tempter. Some are about um, all different kinds of things. But what I think unites these poems, at least for me, is there's an immediacy about them, a kind of directness, a clarity, a straightforwardness. And most importantly, they, infer, they affirm for us today that everyone has the possibility of awakening. These poems don't gloss over life's struggles at all. And their directness and their honesty about the challenges that we all face, I think, allow us to get in touch with our own struggles, with our own cravings, our own aversions, our own delusion and ignorance, and not only to see them as hindrances on the path, but also see them as the path to our own awakening. So they tell about what it's like to be a daughter, a wife, a partner, a mother. And remember that 2600 years ago, this was a very patriarchal world, probably more patriarchal than ours is today. So these poems are radical. They are radical in the best sense of the word. They are women about women finding their voice in a very male dominated society and using it they affirm that women have a voice just as much as men and that women are equal to men in terms of their spiritual attainments. That everyone can realize freedom, no matter their gender, their background, their social status, whatever. They give us a glimpse of awakening. And in doing so, we can see the Buddhist path as a wise and skillful way to cope with the sexism and the injustice that we see today in our society. We can use the same path to respond to today's injustices just as the nuns did 2600 years ago, whether it's sexism, racism, ageism, able-bodiedism, and any other type of discrimination, repression, and oppression that we experience. And I think this is one reason to read these poems today. The words of these first nuns speak directly to our experiences and our conditions today, especially if you're a woman. I think a second reason to study and read these poems today is that they're works of art. They are so imaginative, the expressions, the experiences, the nuances that these nuns draw out. And they are written in very beautiful and deeply moving words. It's as if to me, at any rate, they somehow cut through that head, you know, and reach directly into the heart of what it's like to be a human being and a woman with such a tenderness and a poignancy and a directness that I think is very rare. 
So that's the second reason that I think these poems are so rich today. And the third reason is that these poems tell us about the history and culture of northern India at the time of the Buddha. So they really help us to better understand the Buddha and his teachings. They give us, I think, a glimpse into everyday life at the time that can really inform our relationship with the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha of his day. But I want to focus more on the first two reasons um, in what I'm going to talk about this evening. The fact that these poems affirm that everyone has the possibility for awakening, no matter what our personal circumstances and no matter how much we've suffered in life, and also that they are, I think, spiritual works of art, and I hope you'll agree with me. So now um, I want to turn to the poem that we're going to explore this evening, and um, I'm going to have a go at sharing my screen um, with the poem. It's Dantica's poem, and here I go. Okay, so can you see that? I'll just expand it. So here is Dantica's poem. While walking along the river, after a long day meditating on Vulture Peak, I watched an elephant splashing its way out of the water and up the bank. Hello, my friend, a man waiting there said, scratching the elephant behind its ear. Did you have a good bath? The elephant stretched out its leg. The man climbed up. And the two rode off like that, together. Seeing what had once been so wild, now a friend and companion to this good man, I took a seat under the nearest tree and reached out a gentle hand to my own mind. Truly, I thought, this is why I came to the woods. And this is the version translated and adapted by Matty Weingast. So let's look at this poem a little bit. And if you've got a copy handy, um, I invite you to um, look at it if it's helpful. So first of all, who was Dantica? Who was this woman that wrote these words about watching an elephant take a bath. Well, we don't know a whole lot about her. We know that she was from Savita, now called Sravasti in northeast India, um, part of the ancient kingdom of Kosala. And um, I can't resist telling you that I'm going to be visiting Savita in about a month from now. <laughs> on a pilgrimage that I'm going on. We know that Dantica was the daughter of a minister, so presumably she was born into a well-to-do, fairly well-to-do family. And we also know that she took the robe, became a nun in other words, under a nun called Mahapajapati Gotami who was the very first Buddhist nun, and she was also the Buddha's stepmother. And um, I'll probably talk more about Mahapajapati Gautami's poem, because she has a poem in the Theragata as well, um, next time. So let's get back to Dantika. So as you can see in her poem, Dantika uses a lot of imagery 
taken from nature in this in her words now she isn't alone in this some of the other nuns poems also use images from nature but the ones she chooses and describes so simply and so directly would have been very very familiar to her audience so let's start with the elephant so the elephant is perhaps the main character in this poem an elephant taking a bath and in buddhism the elephant commonly represents the mind and of course elephants were, were common in the buddha's time and he often talked about them in the suttas so elephants were very familiar to both to monastics and to the lay sangha and in a bit more detail a wild elephant in buddhism represents our kind of uncontrolled passionate minds just like a, a rampaging elephant um, is not controlled it's unregulated its passions are running wild right so our minds can often run wild we we're reactive to our circumstances we get angry we get fearful we get greedy and all those other emotions we let our minds be overtaken by our passions by our emotions and then we do things and say things that we might regret later that might harm people so dantika here is using the elephant as a symbol of the mind and this is really helpful for three reasons first of all if an elephant is wild which is obviously not the case in this poem but just to say if an elephant is wild it's very dangerous to other animals and of course also to itself and likewise if our minds are not controlled they can do harm to others and harm to ourselves the Buddha teaches that all suffering is caused by our passions, our desires, our greed, our aversion. In other words, an untamed mind. So that's what many of us have, I think, is an untamed or maybe a partially tamed mind. But if an elephant is tamed, then it obeys its master. It follows instructions, it follows guidance. Even if the instructions or the guidance are complicated or difficult. Moreover, if the elephant, the wild elephant is tamed with kindness and gentleness, it obeys its master out of love and respect, not out of fear or terror. So similarly, if we let our minds our wild minds be tamed gently and kindly and lovingly by the dharma and by the buddha it will do anything our minds will do anything no matter how difficult or challenging out of respect out of love for the buddha the dharma and of course the sangha another reason why the use of this of the elephant the analogy of the elephant is helpful in Dantika's poem is that the elephant has a larger footprint than any other animal in the forest. The elephants were the giants of the forest and because of this the elephants influenced the smaller animals around them. If the elephant is wild and out of control, then it's likely that others close by will pick up on the elephant's energy and also be wild and out of control. Conversely, if the elephant is tamed and peaceful, then it will influence the other animals around it to be peaceful themselves. In other words, I might say that emotions are contagious especially those of a large self, a large ego. And this theme of 
the taming of elephants as a, a metaphor and analogy for taming the mind is com is not unknown in Buddhism, especially in Tibetan Buddhism that has developed um, a series beautiful pictures of a series of 10 steps involved in taming the wild elephant of our minds. And in these pictures, the elephant starts out as black, usually to represent its wildness. And um, there's usually a monk in the picture who is trying to lead the elephant. Um, and that's the part of ourselves that seeks to awaken, to alleviate suffering. And there's also sometimes a monkey um, who is also often black to represent um, our mental distractedness um, and the flame of wise effort and also a rabbit sometimes who represents lethargy. And gradually over the series of the steps of taming the elephant, the elephant becomes white and doesn't have to be led so much anymore, leads itself, knows the direction it wants to go in. So it's a beautiful series of steps um, and it can be fun to look at this. You can see images of these steps if you look for them on the web. So Dantica's use of the elephant here in her poem is a very skillful um, approach and resonate would resonate very well with her audience. Um, and sometimes it's fun to think of how wild are our own minds? How tamed are we? Where would we put ourselves in terms of taming our own minds on that path of, of taming the wildness? So I want to turn now to some of the places that Dantica mentions in her poem. And the first one that she mentions is Vulture Peak. Vulture Peak is an actual place. Um, it's close to Rajya in Bihar province, also in northern India. And it's named Vulture Peak because if you look at a pit photograph of it, it actually resembles a, a, vult, a sitting vulture with folded wings. More importantly, perhaps it's a place that the Buddha liked to go on retreat and he liked to teach there and train his followers. And monastics often used to go there as well. And today it's a pilgrimage site. And um, of course, Vulture Peak too is mentioned frequently in the suttas. And mountains like Vulture Peak in Buddhism tend to represent the unchanging natural order of the universe. In other words, the Dharma, the way things are. And climbing mountains often becomes a metaphor for spiritually ascending to awakening. We're climbing the mountain and the path leads upwards. And because the path leads upwards, it can be hard, it can be arduous, it requires some effort. So when Dantica says that she's had a long day meditating on Vulture Peak, we know that she's probably been putting some effort into her practice. She's been trying to practice, she's been trying to reach awakening. But the poem also talks about rivers. And rivers in Buddhism are another symbol for the journey towards awakening, of course. You know, we think about stream entry as the first step towards arahantship. And once we enter the stream, we flow down the stream or the river towards the ocean of Nibbana. And this flowing is effortless. You know, once we are in the stream, we flow effortlessly, or relatively effort, effort, effortlessly. So it can be interesting to compare the symbolism of ascending the mountain and the effort that goes into that 
with the effortlessness of being in the stream of awakening. And you might like to reflect on whether your practice is sometimes like climbing, climbing a mountain and takes effort. Or maybe sometimes, I hope, it's like a stream and it's relatively effortless. And what makes the difference between those two when practice is like an, a hard ascent or when it's like a natural descent into the ocean of Nirvana? So along with this effortlessness of being in the stream or in the river, rivers also symbolize flowing, kind of goes together, right? Flowing, changing, impermanence, and this constant interplay of causes and conditions that's producing something new all the time. Things are rising, passing away, eddies, little white water perhaps. Rivers representing impermanence, of course, is not unique to Buddhism either. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, you can't step into the same river twice. So the ancient Greeks knew something about impermanence as well and using rivers as a metaphor for impermanence. And of course, rivers and streams contain water, even though Dantika doesn't mention water directly. But water often symbolizes purity and clarity and calmness in Buddhism. So when Dantika's elephant is taking a bath in the river in her poem, there's something here about the mind being cleansed and cleaned, being purified so it can be tamed and be of service to others. And I think that cleansing of the river is also part of the practice. How do we cleanse ourselves? How do we purify ourselves? How do we reach calmness? Another place that Dantika mentions is the woods. Trees and woods, of course, are sacred to the Buddhism. To Buddhism. The Buddha's mother, Maya, grasped a sal tree while she was giving birth in Lumbini to the Buddha. The Buddha's first jhana meditation was under a rose apple tree. He awakened under the Bodhi tree. And he died under two sal trees. So trees in Buddhism represent those really transformative moments in his life, in the Buddha's life. Those moments when Form touched formlessness, if you like. So it's not surprising that the Buddha advised his followers to meditate under a tree, in the root of a tree or at the base of a tree or in the forest. For example, in the Satipatthana Sutta, he tells his monks to go to the forest or to the foot of a tree and to sit down and meditate on the breath. And again, Buddhism's use of trees to symbolize something deeper is not unique. It's found in other faith traditions as well. I think of the tree of life, that universal archetype of the connection between the mundane and the sacred between heaven and earth, between the spiritual and the material, between samsara and nibbana, if you like. They form that point of connection. Trees grow out of the earth and they reach up to the skies, to the heavens, towards the light. 
towards enlightenment. So towards the end of the poem, when Dantika says that she took a seat under the nearest tree, she's saying not only that she went to meditate under a tree, but also that she went to grow and develop herself towards the light, towards awakening. It's a really beautiful image, I think. And again, we can reflect on our own relationship with trees, literally and metaphorically. How do trees nourish your awakening, your wisdom, your compassion? I was meeting with a student this afternoon and her practice is to walk and she goes to a tree every day and sits underneath it and puts her hand on it. She uses the tree as her meditation object. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So to wrap this up, in this really seemingly simple short poem, Dantika uses some of the most powerful symbols of nature in early Buddhism, the elephant, the mountains, rivers and streams, water and trees, all woven together in this beautifully exquisite language. So now I'd like to close by reading her poem again. And let's see if I can bring up screen sharing again. Great. So just really take this poem in as you listen to it. Maybe close your eyes if you'd like to and hear Dantika's words reaching out to us across 25, 2600 years. While walking along the river, after a long day meditating on Vulture Peak, I watched an elephant splashing its way out of the water and up the bank. Hello, my friend, a man waiting there said, scratching the elephant behind its ear. Did you have a good bath? The elephant stretched out its leg. The man climbed up and the two rode off like that together. Seeing what had once been so wild, now a friend and companion to this good man, I took a seat under the nearest tree and reached out a gentle hand to my own mind. Truly, I thought, this is why I came to the woods.